I guess I would call it sympathy. Uh, I thought that I couldn't investigate that without actually making paintings of people. So maybe these were the first two. Marie Jose Reyes died in 2012. This is an untitled beheading. And again, if you're if you're asking any questions, I can't see them at the second at the moment, but I'll get to it. And again, this was very early, so I was still trying to figure out what the picture would look like. I have this myth in my head that if I can figure out the right shape for a painting, that the content will not matter. There's this old saying um, that the medium is the message. The idea that painting has a meta message that all paintings communicate. And the power of painting is not in the particular content of any painting, but in the kind of meta message of the medium. What I think Hegel referred to as the soul of the medium. Uh, modern untitled tragic timeline. It's a huge collage, maybe 40 feet. And this was my first thinking about um, the beheading paintings those little moments of collage, black circles and the, and the orange, like those were the first moment of me kind of trying to conceptualize it and work it out on paper. Um, 2019 is the year. And what I did was I collected a bunch of modern tragedies, mass tragedies. Let me see if I can read it. Hargazian Holocaust. You know, Armenian genocides. So all of these tragedies that we don't really know much about that are all happening in the modern day. And so this, I guess in a way was before I really started making paintings of people and, and I was making paintings of abstract spaces that might have geometry, they might have atmosphere. So this is kind of a cloudy space. And also with the Star of David, uh, it's sort of, you know, it's the first painting I paint in, in, in any series. And it was sort of the painting that, you know, I stopped painting for a couple of years um, and just worked in collage Maybe I'll get to those. And what was stopping me from painting as an abstractionist and as a person who paints large is that, I mentioned that idea of a meta message, is that you can't make a giant abstract painting that is about anything other than how awesome painting is. Uh, you can think it's about other things, but that's the actual message that gets communicated. And, um, so I couldn't paint for a couple years. And maybe I have a picture of, let's see if I go back far enough. Okay. So I was just making collage and these were the collages I were making, these large scale quilt collages of Annie Leibovitz's work. One reason I was working with Annie Leibovitz and other uh, white women photographers uh, I was interested in this idea that marginalized artists sort of had this position of native informants where we would talk about our lives or something or, our, you know, the exotic uh, existences or something. But white women photographers had this other role of being like a spy where they could go into like a brothel in India or an enclave in the Appalachian Mountains and they would report on those people and bring that report back to us. But that seemed like a more long-term role because as a native informant, there comes a point when I've told you everything you need to know and then you know I'm no longer of any use. 
but the spy can go into different places. And I was also interested in how in painting at this time, let's see when it was made. That couldn't have been made in 2000. Yeah, okay, so maybe 2010. So anyway, um, in painting, there was sort of this agreement that painters don't paint people they don't identify with. Uh, they only paint their own identity. So if you see a painting of an Asian woman, then an Asian woman painted it. If you see a painting of a Black man, a Black man painted it. But in photography, they didn't have that agreement. And um, so I might go, you know, to a, a strip club in New Jersey and photograph Asian strippers or something like that. And I was interested in what photographers could still access through this objectification uh, that painting had lost, right? So I've always been kind of, that's sort of my interest in collage is trying to figure out what their objectification um, still has to teach us. But another thing that I learned from collage was kind of shattering the picture plane. And that's when, I guess this was probably the first painting I made uh, after after working in collage, and you see how, how it's inspired by that, it taught me that I could uh, do one thing in one place and another thing in another place. And the specific content also helped me. So the shattering helped me formally. And uh, the specific content, I remembered how uh, I was taught in concentration camps. People wore Stars of David that were color-coded. The colors would say why you were there. Um, so for gypsies or, or you know, communists and, and so forth. And the two I remembered were for sex criminals, it was a pink star. For Jews, it was a yellow star. And I remembered all of this kind of art theory and color theory related to the idea of World War II. Like in my day, we used to have art history books that were called Art After 1945. And, you know, they, Hitler had the... Uh, uh, degenerate art show and it was art the, the whole kind of concept of the victory of abstraction was very tied up in World War II and um, I was interested in how the concept of survival was a way to escape the victory of abstraction this kind of binary opposition of winning and losing um, the, the, the star is also a body so there are hands and there are feet and there are genitals and there is a head and the shopping list is in the, in the, in the body. Um, I had a conversation with the painter, Audrey Flack, who's a uh, photorealist and, and she has a painting Vanitas uh, for World War II, I think it might be called. And she was saying how back when she painted it in the eighties, uh, she was nervous about it it's kind of like a painting of like candy and, and beautiful things and a star of David. And it's about the Holocaust and it's also about consumption and pleasure. Uh, and so this painting also came out of that in some ways, but this idea of survival rather than victory, the survival of abstraction rather than its victory, uh, the shattering of the picture plane, how to approach pleasure and bodies, uh, started me painting again. And I think I'm going to open, I'm going to close my presentation so I can see the questions again in case there's something I should answer. Okay. Uh, my apologies uh, for using the term gypsy, which is a racial slur. I should have uh, said Romani. Uh, the, the connotations of the Star of David as a Jewish symbol, how do I think of it? I think of it, it completely as, as through its connotation as a Jewish symbol. I think the kind of problem of contemporary art um, is how do we paint a world where we're not the only person in it? And, you know, the question of identity and identification. Uh, can we only paint 
other human beings when we can claim to be that person uh, is like kind of one of the the issues of identity art right now. Um, one, the mother of a, of a black uh, person who was killed by police, she recently uh, copyrighted the image of her son because black artists were using it so much and making money from it. And that's kind of one of the dark sides of identification, of uh, empathy, is if I say, like empathy is saying, I am you. Uh, sympathy is saying, I see you and will act on your behalf or something. But empathy is saying, I am you, I'm like you, I feel what you feel. And the dark side of me saying, I am you, is when I try to write checks in your name and try to access your bank account. Uh, yeah, so I think that that's sort of a, a, a thing we have to figure out in, in identity art, which I think is the most interesting kind of art to be making today. Because identity art, I think, is a direct confrontation of one of the most important concepts of, of modernism, which is the idea of personal art. Uh, art that kind of comes from an inner, an individual inner self. Identity art is this art that comes from some collective outer self. Uh, so I think it's the most important provocation to modernism in painting. And uh, I just want to understand it. Is there something I'm learning when I move through the various shapes of painting. You know, I feel that you can't make a painting that is all over blue and all over yellow at the same time, right? Uh, because the blue will push the yellow out or vice versa. And there are certain kind of concepts, like I don't think you can make a painting that is abstract and representational at the same time, because the representational element will just make the abstraction um, like uh, an environment or something like that. Uh, so there are aspects of painting that won't allow each other to happen and they push each other out into other paintings. And that's, I think, what I'm trying to learn and see and get a feel for is how, is what, what aspects of painting are mutually exclusive kind of in the same piece. What led me away from the rectangle? So um, there's kind of an agreement, you know, there's an old saying that every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. There's an agreement in painting that we can ignore the format of the painting. And once you do that, it's possible to make paintings about nothing. But if you don't ignore the, because the, you can make a blue painting or something like that, and it has no subject. But if you, if the format is also a part of the meaning, then you can never make a painting about nothing. And I think that painting or abstraction was, is sometimes treated as a safe space, uh, a, pa a space without content. Uh, and I did not want to paint within a space without content. So making shaped paintings is, is kind of uh, necessary to just signify that there's no agreement in my paintings. And um, I'm willing, hopefully, to take responsibility for them entirely. Uh, so, you know, the first painting I made was the two stars of Dave at the shopping list. And that painting was 20 feet wide and 10 feet tall. But nobody ever thought it was about the victory of abstraction or how awesome painting was because it had content. Uh, yeah, so what question was I answering? That was why I, I don't generally use rectangles. Never say never. So um, can you address individualism? the American myth of it and the kind of counter impulse to it. 
So um, I guess one of the main kind of concepts of art history is this idea of personal art, let's say the art of Van Gogh, versus the art of a hegemonic society, like ancient Egypt or something like that. They would look at the art of a hegemonic society, which is a society where people tell the artist what to do. Like the art of that society, I'm going to admit, Jorge Reyes, I'm not sure who he is. Uh, the art of that society represents the progress, hey, represents the progress of that society, whereas the art of individuals in a free society, like let's say Van Gogh or me, it represents the psychological progress of that individual. Um, and that's like personal art because if the individual is not told what to make, then everything they do, we do, is significant, right? And you can read it and understand. And in an art history book, they talk about Van Gogh's life or Picasso's life or, or my life. And they show you my art as it progresses with my life. And uh, that's how it kind of has meaning. So that's personal art in a free society. And of course, I'm sure as I say those things, you feel a resistance. Maybe our society isn't free. Or, you know, I think one of the great things about identity art, um, let's say Kerry James Marshall, he makes a painting of black men and women in Harlem uh, at a dance hall. That is not a painting of his life. It's a painting of his identity in a sense. He may never have been in a situation like that. It's just a racial situation, right? But if Carrie Marshall were to paint paintings of his actual life, they probably would be boring because he's probably just some random middle-class person who doesn't do interesting things. So the idea that my identity, um, there's a Langston Hughes poem called uh, The Negro Sings of Rivers in where he talks about how blackness, my identity, is hundreds of years old, thousands of years old, tens of thousands of years old, and has done wonderful things and has suffered horrible things and is this huge spirit. Whereas I, like in comparison to that huge spirit, uh, who would care about me? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I I'm always kind of moved by that provocation of, uh, of identity art as opposed to personal art, which comes from some inner life and, and personal struggles. Uh, uh, how important is it that the viewers of your work recognize the conceptual basis for your works? And how invested am I in legibility? Well, I mean, I can't be more invested in legibility than writing things down in the painting. And there's a URL, so you can't uh, can't go too far astray. Uh, I guess, in a funny way, things that are important for you to know, I write down, and uh, and I try to use text only to do things that pictures won't do. And that's why sometimes I'll, only, I'll try to make the exact same painting. I make a text painting and I'll try to make that painting without text to see if there's some aspect that text is unnecessary for. So I think that a URL, that no picture is a URL. Uh, an exception may be those like, I forget what they, they're called, like QEC codes or something. They're like this black grid. Um, but that's a little too mechanical for me. So um, anything that's important for you to know, I just write it. And everything else is aesthetics. Uh, aesthetic means sensual feeling. So everything else is the, is the feeling of the work. And I try to be very aggressive in how the work feels uh, to make sure that that is also something that is hopefully not just dependent on convention. Uh, you know, that red is for Valentine's Day or something like that. Uh, but sometimes I do use signs and conventions. 
Relationship to Hegel. Um, that's another kind of aspect of modernism and, uh, you know, 1945 and I guess I'm very interested in, in, in structuralism and post-structuralism. The idea that, um, again, that structures are their own content. They don't contain something, but the structure itself is uh, the content. Uh, and that relates back to, um, to the painting. I guess one of my favorite quotes from the Bible. Let me see if I can remember it. Wisdom is to folly as light is to darkness. Uh, the wise man has his eyes in his head, but the fool knows not at what he stumbles. And that quote is a series of binary oppositions, wisdom and folly, light and darkness, blindness and sight. And the way that a binary opposition works is there's a thesis, there's a thing you start with, and there's an antithesis which repairs a flaw in the thesis. So the flaw of uh, blindness is that you can't see stuff and you repair that flaw with sight. The flaw of foolishness is that you don't know stuff. You repair that flaw with knowledge. Uh, the flaw of darkness is that you cannot see things. You repair that flaw with light. And all binary oppositions, tall is to short as in is to out, as big is to small, as hot is to cold, as up is to down. The binary oppositions are all equivalent because their meaning is actually in their structure and not in their content. And uh, so that kind of post-structural thinking in my paintings, my paintings are kind of just, you know, the way you escape structuralism is not by rejecting it, but by transcending it from inside so you just absorb so many structures that it kind of blossoms outward. And in my paintings, uh, and in my paintings, I try to just go through painting gestures, stretching, nailing, sawing, painting, cutting, whatever. Uh, so many of them that the painting will blossom at some point into something else. So that's my attachment to Hegel. And Hegel is just what was taught to me. That's what it meant to be educated uh, back when I was in school, when I was your age. It's the same thing like, you know, I, I think of my enlightenment through the lens of my Christianity, but I know that I simply happen to be a Christian. It's not something I didn't convert to it. It's just what I was taught and, and I, I try to make use of it and respect it and so forth. Um, this is a good one. Do you feel, not that the others were bad, do you feel being an artist removes you from the culture in order to work, that the boring life of artists is a result of the work style of studio artists? You know, uh, what's his name? Um, Greenberg wrote this essay called Kitchen the Avant-Garde, where his proposal was that in the olden days when we used to make folk art, artists were a part of culture. But if we were a part of culture, we basically could just make, all we would be making is paintings of Beyonce or whatever culture was, we'd be attached to culture and we wouldn't even know anything else, right? Um, but what happened to create vanguardism is artists became conscious of art's own history so that art could have its own trajectory separate from the trajectory of culture. Uh, so I'm, I'm, again, just like I was raised as a Christian, uh, I was raised as, as a vanguardist. That's the concept of art that I was raised with. So that's the tradition that I work within. I can't tr transcend things that I was not raised in. Uh, like I can't transcend Buddhism. I'm not a Buddhist, but I can transcend Christianity from within. Like I can 
deconstruct it or make use of it. And so I try to transcend vanguardism, uh, abstract vanguardism, but from inside of it, not by rejecting it. Because there is, you know, there's a difference between a lie and a myth. And I think that abstract vanguardism is a myth, but there is enlightenment within it. I think that that's the difference between a lie and a myth. And I think we should probably stop, I'm sorry. And maybe... Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think you're right that it was, well, first of all, absolutely amazing, but I, I wouldn't mind perhaps, did you wanna take a couple of verbal questions? Sure. Audio? I, I, yeah, that's actually what I was thinking even though I stopped myself and I'm like, well, I guess it doesn't make <laughs> no difference, but I'll be old fashioned. And if anybody would like to say anything with their physical, and you all should have access to be able to unmute yourself. There's no, um, there's no whatever. Muting surveillance happening at this particular moment. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and somebody, and uh, well, let me go back up. And painting patterns and the idea of adornment you know, the only thing I shy away from is the idea of craft. Um, I feel that what separates craft from art, you know, if you believe in binary oppositions, like what separates the wise from the foolish, um, is that craft, most of its labor is absolutely necessary for it to exist. Like a car, the stuff they do to it, you have to do or it won't even work. But works of art, most of the work is free. Uh, you don't have to do it. It's all done by choice. And that's what makes it um, meaningful relative to the artist. Um, there's a term for that. And I forget what it is when something is, when every aspect of it is meaningful. So I guess craft, I am kind of afraid of. And that's why my paintings also look poorly made. But I'm not so afraid of, of design and like adornment and stuff like that. I'm not so afraid of that. I guess I am a little afraid of, uh, of repetition. I, I somehow got it in my head uh, in creativity theories of various kinds. It's kind of uncreative to respond to a stimulus simply by repeating it over and over again. So if you had a triangle and you drew triangles within it, that would somehow be less creative uh, than some other response. And also somehow got it in my head that when you title something, to give it an abstract title is more creative than giving it a literal title. So I'm always at pressure to give paintings abstract titles, which is why I sometimes give them multiple titles, one abstract and one literal and so forth. Um, I'll ask a question. Ooh, sorry, one sec. We're zooming in the same room. Um, thank you so much for talking to us. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I was just thinking right now, I'd love to hear more about how you feel like you are, or uh, how you're excavating or transcending Christianity from within, or what your experience with that has been in your work. Well, that actually does not happen at all in the work, I don't think. Um, I'm probably not religious enough to transcend it. You know, that takes a lot of work and I'm probably just not that religious. So I actually shouldn't have used that as an example. Um, yeah. Are you a Christian? That's. No, but, uh, I was just interested in that when you were just now, when you were talking about the, like the things that you inhabit, right. I guess I think about the things we grow up with specifically faith and when we don't and how that affects us and what it means to come to a faith or something, but no, I'm not Christian. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I'm not religious enough to have the investment to like get past something. Um, yeah. I think that, but I do the, those things in painting because that's what I do so many hours of the day. Um, 
And I, yeah, and, and maybe I do those things in certain kind of philosophical traditions that I was raised in, but I'm probably just not religious enough to transcend it. Thank you. So if that's everyone's questions. Everyone? Well, it was just completely amazing hearing you and um, th th that unpack of, of um, personal versus identity was pretty much worth its weight and I don't know what, whatever's valuable now. Maybe it's a Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that was superb, sir. I'm honored to have been able to sit with you over this last hour and a half or so, hour and 42 minutes to hear that. That was incredible. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll see some of you tomorrow, I suppose. Or I think it's a, uh, right, do you had a oh, joint day, right? Wednesday. Yep. Wednesday. So yeah. I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, really. And um, I may, maybe I'll bump into you in Chicago. It seems like I'm doing a talk there in the spring or something. <laughs> or at Very least cool. over the digitals. <laughs> I look forward to it. Oh, no. Thank you so much, Mike. All right. Good night. Yep.